Yes, uh, Mr. Hames, sorry to have kept you waiting. Not at all, my lord, thank you. Um, in this appeal, I appear on behalf of the appellant together with my learned friend, Ms. Parr. Uh, the respondent is represented by my learned friend, Mr. Setrack, Queen's Counsel, with Ms. Bruce. Uh, I'm afraid I'm the odd one out of, of the barristers who appear before my laws today because I did not appear uh, in the court below, whereas everyone else did. Um, we are concerned with uh, a little girl who I shall call L, uh, given that this yes. has been live streamed. Uh, and of course, uh, my lord, anyone listening to this live stream shouldn't reveal any information that might lead to the discovery of her name. Thank you for saying that. Yes, it is being live streamed. As you say, these proceedings concern a child, so nobody should disclose any information which might reveal uh, the child's identity. So yes, refer to the child as L. Uh, thank you. She was born on the 20th of October 2016, so she is now aged five years and around four months. Uh, my Lords, this is an appeal brought with the permission of my Lord, Lord Justice Peter Jackson, dated the 22nd of December 2021. His uh, order is in the core bundle at page 85. Uh, and my lords will observe that he expressed the view that ground two perhaps had more legs than the other grounds. And I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, my lord, it's an appeal against the decision of Mr. Justice MacDonald, uh, sitting in the family division of the High Court, where he dismissed <coughs> my appeal uh, against the registration um, in the principal registry of the family division uh, on the 6th of July 2021 for the enforcement of an order made by uh, the French Court of Appeal sitting in Saint-Denis in La Réunion uh, the previous 21st of October, so 21st of October 2020. Mr Justice MacDonald also uh, dismissed the mother's uh, application for a child arrangements order uh, that had been made as long ago as the 17th of July 2019, initially in the Liverpool Family Court uh, and then transferred to be heard by a High Court judge. Uh, he also uh, ordered the enforcement of the order of uh, the local French Court of Appeal order uh, effectively and in summary by requiring L to be returned to La Réunion and furthermore into the care of the respondent father. My Lords, by way of housekeeping, my Lord should have received an updated core appeal bundle uh, and then a... The updating is only the addition of what is it? Submissions? I think I, is that right? the transcript. I've only yes. seen... That's what I meant. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 the transcript of the submissions. Yes. Uh, there is then also an updated supplementary bundle, which I received on the 22nd of February, 2022. Oh, I haven't... I must have identified what was additional. I, I think the main addition was the... Uh, inclusion of the C100 that I've already referred to at page 14, oh, okay. dated the 17th of July 2019. <coughs> yes. Thank you. There is then an authorities bundle. Yes. Uh, very late last night, and, and I apologise for this. Uh, I arranged for my lords to receive two further authorities. Uh, Puraka number two, a decision of the CJU, uh, and also a uh, decision of this court called Hedikar and Hedikar. Do you have copies of those available or not? Um, I don't in paper form, but no, I can don't arrange worry. for them. Yep. No, don't worry. I've only got... Uh, Parika, the I think the passages that you, or well, the paragraphs that uh, you referred to. So yes. I, haven't, I haven't got the whole, my lords, I haven't got the whole decision. 
Have any got those paragraphs? Yes, a, a lot of the report refers to the Advocate General's um, opinion in any yes. event. Yeah. Um, my Lord, I think I'll be only referring to this section uh, of the paragraphs that I hope my Lord has already right. seen. Thank you. Uh, and my Lord, finally, this morning, um, my learned friends lodged or re-lodged their supplemental skeleton argument that was before uh, the court below, and that's dated the 28th of October 2021. I'm not sure that I've got that. What's it look like? My Lord, it... My Lord, it's unaccountable that it wasn't in the bundle. Um, so we provided it electronically this right. morning, but we do have hard copies. Which are we putting it in, the core or the supplemental? Um, that would go in the supplemental bundle. Right. Um, and, my Lord, um, if I, it will go, if my Lord's pleased, at 165A onwards. Okay, have you got um, copies for us? And so here they are, three copies, paginated and not stapled, but punched. And this is, well, I'll see it when it comes. It's important because that is the final version of the written case for the um, father as placed before Mr. Catherine McDonald. Right. And so we would invite my Lord to as to why it wasn't responded. Don't worry about that, it's set right here. Right, okay. Thank you. Yes. My Lord, finally dealing with these sorts of issues, my Lords will see that um, we haven't included the entire trial bundle of documents that was before no, Mr. Yes. McDonald. If there are other documents uh, that are needed, I'm sure those behind me can furnish the court with them. Um, my Lord, uh, in summary, our case is that the court below was wrong not to exercise a substantive welfare jurisdiction uh, on the appellant C100, uh, as I said, made as long ago as the 17th of July 2019. Um, the judge, the learned judge, was wrong uh, to find that by virtue of Article 19, subparagraph 2 of the Council Regulation B2A, that he was either not endowed with jurisdiction or uh, he was not permitted to exercise that ju jurisdiction uh, because he found that the French jurisdiction uh, had not concluded uh, its own jurisdictional exercise into the best interests and welfare of L. Uh, moreover, he was wrong in the way that um, he bettered his discretion when he did accept, um, following the decision of the Court de Cassation in Paris, uh, that he did have uh, a welfare jurisdiction, that he fettered that discretion by only looking at the change of circumstances uh, since the French Court of Appeal decision on the 21st of October 2020. Um, we uh, respectfully submit that if, if he had carried out an appropriate welfare investigation and hadn't fettered his discretion uh, in that way and had considered all of the circumstances, uh, he would have made a welfare inquiry that would have produced the result that we contend for, namely that L would remain in England uh, with the appellant who has throughout her life been her main carer. Well, that might or might not be the outcome of the inquiry. But 
Who well, it, it might not be, but yes. it's, it's very much part of our case that, that um, if, if he hadn't fettered his discretion, that would have been uh, the likely uh, outcome. And it may, I, I accept my Lord, not be necessary for me to go quite as far as that, but I make no apologies for going as far as that in trying to persuade uh, this court that Mr Justice MacDonald was wrong uh, in the way that he exercised the welfare jurisdiction that he undoubtedly had. Uh, and my lords, having made that determination, or at any rate any determination that was inconsistent uh, with the determination of the um, La Réunion Court of the 21st of October 2020, uh, he should then have allowed the appellant's appeal against the registration for enforcement of that order under Article 23E of the Council Regulation. My Lord, um, if those grounds are accepted by this Court, uh, I needn't dwell on Ground 3. Ground 3 is an alternative route uh, by which we submit that this court can disturb the decision below. It is an alternative way that the English courts can allow an appeal against registration under Article 23A. Uh, my Lord, as we've accepted in our skeleton argument, uh, that is perhaps more of an uphill struggle uh, for us. Uh, but nonetheless, we take on the challenge uh, and we submit that it is manifestly contrary to public policy for the English courts uh, to register orders and then enforce them, which cause the harm and trauma that we submit is inevitable to L from L's perspective if this order uh, is to be enforced. And moreover, it is an unnecessary and disproportionate interference with Earl's Article 8 rights uh, when uh, all that was necessary, um, we would suggest, we would submit, uh, was a proper regulation, uh, a, a proper organisation, a proper management of her contact uh, with the respondent father always taking account her best interests uh, and bearing in mind that the practical reality uh, of her life is that her father lives some 6,200 miles away uh, and given that we've just hopefully leaving the uh, COVID pandemic and the consequences that has had on international travel and the international movement of children in particular, uh, that uh, it was uh, a disproportionate response to go straight to a transfer of custody uh, from her main carer, her main attachment figure, and everything that she saw as familiar in this country uh, to a different carer, uh, an untested carer, who works full time uh, and lives such a long way uh, from her main carer uh, in circumstances where in all practical as well as financial reality uh, it was almost impossible, in fact my client would say is impossible, uh, for Elle to remain in any sort of contact, to have any sort of family life uh, with uh, Elle uh, should Elle move to La Reunion. Uh, my Lord, as we've observed uh, in our skeleton, there uh, may well be uh, an obvious tension here between uh, the working, the technical workings, as we would put it, uh, of the international instruments on the one hand, uh, and what I've just um, submitted uh, as to be the, certainly from a provisional perspective, we would suggest is the obvious outcome in Elle's best interests. Um, that may be why, um, my Lord, below, 
uh, described the case as, and I quote, very difficult uh, to decide, which is a point that he makes uh, in paragraph 78 of his judgment. My Lord, what I propose to do is to take my Lord through some of the factual material, particularly in the uh, supplemental skeleton, uh, before amplifying uh, the grounds that we present on this appeal. Can I then take my lords to the um, updated supplemental bundle? Uh, and the when you said in the supplemental skeleton, you meant supplementary bundle. Did I say I meant supplementary bundle? Yeah, because we haven't. You haven't filed a supplemental skeleton. No, no. Good. That's all I wanted to. I, yes. Yes, we, my, Ms. Parr and myself, have filed one yes. skeleton, yes. which was the skeleton that Lord Justice Peter Jackson saw for the application for both a stay and permission to appeal. Yes. Uh, my Lord, the um, C100 at page 14 is the application that we rely upon as grounding the jurisdiction in England and Wales. Yes. Uh, my Lord, then, if I may, going back to page 8, uh, my Lord has the earlier uh, decision of the High Court in Réunion. Yes. Uh, which uh, sets out at, at page 9 the uh, account of the dispute. Um, you'll notice halfway down that the respondent's case um, as at the 4th of February 2019 that the minor child should have her usual place of residence with the mother uh, admittedly in La Réunion that was, that was his case there and it's our submission that it was uh, always uh, his case that it was appropriate for L to remain in the primary care of her mother uh, as she had been throughout her life. And indeed, my lords will see shortly, or a little bit above that, uh, recounting the um, interim order that had been made on the 21st of December uh, 2018, where, uh, as an interim measure, uh, pending receipt of a social welfare report, uh, the um, family court judge had established the child's usual place of residence uh, at the mother's home. It's plain that the dispute, therefore, before the court on this occasion was not a question of who would have custody, not a question as to who would be Elle's principal carer, but moreover, the, and more particularly, uh, the place where Elle should be brought up, the mother contesting that it should be yeah, in England, uh, the father contesting that the mother should uh, stay in uh, La Reunion. Yes. Uh, my lords will see over uh, the page, uh, and I'll take my lords to the, I think, the fourth paragraph where reference is made to the social welfare report starting in this instance from documents submitted to the proceedings, substance of the hearings, and the social welfare report. And I'll take my law to that report in a moment. He noted that the two-year-old child has a close relationship and bond with her mother, cared for since her since birth. Father is aware of the facts of this situation since he suggests establishing uh, Elle's usual place of residence at her mother's. Uh, in uh, Réunion Island. My Lord, at page 11 is the operative part of the decision uh, and towards the bottom uh, there's uh, the grounds establishing that the usual place of residence of L is at the mother's home and then holding that nothing prevents the mother from uh, settling with the minor child in England, the former country of origin. My Lord is then the court sets out uh, the contact regime 
that the father should freely exercise his visiting and accommodation rights and failing agreement, and it's only the first part that is operative for the purposes of this appeal, although the second part may become more important as L gets older, that the contact should be 15 days uh, every two months and one month uh, in July uh, and August. Uh, and then there's provision... My husband, I didn't know that five-year-old children were entitled to travel unaccompanied on airlines. Well... Which is what it says there. Yes. Uh, as my lord... It's not relevant, but I'm just interested to read it. Well, my lord, it, it, it may have this relevance that as my Lord will, may have seen, and I'll be developing in due course, one of the main, in fact, the main concern of the mother and one of the reasons, main reason why she, in fact, invoked the jurisdiction in this court is that she was concerned about the arrangements uh, for Elle's contact, uh, not just in terms of um, where it should take place, but how it should be managed uh, and the periods that she would be away from her, her main carer. I should anyway, I'm diverting you. So we were reading, we've read about that, yes? Yes. Uh, and then in the next, the next paragraph uh, holds that it's the father's responsibility uh, to pick her up and accompany her back yes. uh, with, with the mother merely being responsible for ensuring that she's made available to an appropriate airport um, in England. Uh, my Lord, in, in that back, with that background um, and with that permission, uh, it, it's right that the mother, pretty quickly after this order was received, um, she having been aware of it, she'd been served with it, uh, returned to her home country with Elle uh, on the 9th of February uh, 2019 and she's remained in England uh, ever since. Uh, that was uh, at a time when Elle was two years and three months old. The order's effective immediately. Well, it certainly doesn't say that it isn't effective immediately. I assume it is. Um, yes. Uh, my Lord, uh, unlike... Um, well, just to be absolutely clear, um, there's this provision on page 12 uh, for halfway down the page holds that this decision shall be notified by the petitioner failing that by the first party to take action. Well, above that it says all these measures are provi enforceable provisionally as a right. Exactly. Anyway. Yes. And, uh, my Lord, there is, I don't propose to take my Lord to it in great detail, there is um, witness evidence um, from the mother uh, in the supplementary bundle which um, identifies that very shortly and very soon after Elle had moved to England, uh, she quickly settled uh, into her life in Liverpool and we say that she became integrated pretty quickly. And that is evidenced by uh, the mother exhibiting uh, documents showing that she registered her with a doctor and a dentist. Uh, moreover, that she started uh, in a nursery by May of 2019. Uh, my Lord, going and back to the C-100 that I started this rambulation with, could my Lord please then go on to the statement that uh, accompanied that C-100, which is at page 47. Uh, and I'm going to go through it all um, in detail, but my Lord will essentially see that the uh, reason why uh, the mother made the application is apparent from paragraph 8 at the top of uh, the second page of the statement at page 48. The order is not working. 
deeply concerned as to the impact that it's having on the emotional and physical welfare of L. The order does not specify dates. Only I'm to give 15 days notice. The order is too vague. And then this, L is only two years old and has experienced a great deal of upheaval in her life already without being flown back and forth across the world in different time zones uh, so frequently. My Lord, at this stage, L had had two weeks with her father uh, in London in April 2019 uh, and also two weeks with him in La Réunion in June 2019. I go back to the statement of paragraph 9. The mother sets out that a month is too long for a single trip, uh, and she uh, explains uh, the reasons uh, in the rest of that paragraph. She refers to the difficulties that Elle has had separating from the mother, the length of the journey at paragraph 11, concerns that the mother had as to uh, how Elle was treated when she returned to La Réunion, being a, a, an English speaker, not speaking any French. Uh, and she then sets out why, going to paragraph 15 towards the end of the statement, that she seeks a variation uh, of the terms of the order. Yes. Uh, and then 16, she sets out specifically her, her proposals for the um, variation of that order. Uh, my Lord, um, in order to bolster her claim um, for, for that application, uh, the mother had also obtained one moment. A, a report from a, a psychologist on the 16th of May 2019, which appears at page 232 in the supplemental bundle. I, I accept that this wasn't a, in any sense, a joint instruction. Still less was it a, a court-sanctioned uh, instruction. But it's an indication of the concern that the mother had at that time uh, for L. And uh, my lords will see from a reading of uh, that um, report from the psychotherapist that um, he made various recommendations and suggested suggestions for how contact could be managed with Elle at the age, the stage of the development that she was, which uh, the mother relied upon uh, when she made her application. Yes. Uh, my Lord, I, I'm taking my Lord through this to, to show that by that stage, this was. Firstly, and by that stage I'm talking about the 17th of July uh, 2019, uh, by that stage not only had Elle arrived in England, but she had become integrated into her family life here. As my Lord knows, the essential ingredients of the test for the establishment of habitual residence pursuant to Article 8 of the Council Regulation uh, but also had had, had contact uh, with her father, uh, but on the mother's um, account, on the mother's evidence, uh, contact was not working for L, and she quite properly, in my submission, uh, brought the matter to the court, uh, then seized, or the court that would be seized, based on integration and based on habitual residence. Uh, and the second point is that she had a reason for doing that. Uh, it, it was not a knee-jerk response to any application for enforcement, uh, which one sometimes sees, and my Lord in re Lord Justice Peter Jackson, uh, specifically uh, 
warns the courts um, to be on the lookout for such a tactical manoeuvre. But at this stage, there had been no hint uh, of an appeal from the respondent uh, against uh, the French decision at first instance. My Lord, but um, as the court knows, uh, he did in fact appeal. And um, for the first time in his appeal, he made the suggestion not only that L should live in La Réunion, but also that L should live with him in La Réunion. Uh, we can collect that from the decision of the Saint Denis Court of Appeal which is at 83 in the supplemental bundle. So we're now over 18 months from when L had moved to England and a similar period for when the first instance court had made its decision. It's clear that the, from the face of this order that the hearing giving rise to this judgment was on the 19th of August, 2020. My Lord, at uh, 84 in, in recitals, uh, the um, appellant, as he then was, the father, uh, sets out uh, his um, position, referring to his permission, petition on the 13th of August, uh, 2019, uh, which is the date Therefore, that he launched this appeal the 13th of August, uh, a month, nearly a month after uh, the mother had sought to invoke the jurisdiction of the English court. Uh, and in his um, submissions, which are recounted over the page, his final submissions <laughs> beg the court to challenge what the mother was then characterizing as her, ter her challenge to territorial jurisdiction of France and establishing the child's main residence with the father and then setting out the contact proposals that he was proposing which effectively mirror what the first instance court had ordered. And my Lord then, halfway down the page, in addition, having checked the Translation. This is an addition in the sense of alternatively. Uh, and I think as it's clear that if one reads it, that this is the father's alternative points on appeal, that he was then, a he was then seeking from the La Réunion Court of Appeal, the French Court of Appeal in La Réunion, that the child's main residence should still, I inter inter interpolate, still be with the mother, uh, but then he sought stricter conditions for contact to make sure that it happened, uh, including um, a request for costs. And then over the page 86, following that request for costs, is the um, mother's position. essentially retained the position that the first instance decision uh, had taken with the exception towards the bottom that she did seek uh, a change uh, in the length of time that each contact visit in La Réunion should last. My Lords will have collected both from the mother's C100 in this jurisdiction uh, and also uh, in her submissions to the French Court of Appeal, that at no time was she saying there should be no contact. At no time in my submission was she seeking unduly uh, and improperly and for her own reasons uh, to frustrate or impede contact. Uh, on the contrary, she was trying to make suggestions that would make contact more child-focused and more manageable for L, given the, the age that she had reached uh, and 
the circumstances in which she found herself. My Lord then, page 87 of the grounds um, for the decision. And my Lord, I should say uh, straight away that on an examination of the reasoning of the French Court of Appeal, it does not appeal, it does appear uh, to be an appeal in the sense that an appeal is treated by this court. Uh, there is little, if not any, analysis of the reasoning, let alone the judgment of the first instance court. Uh, and in our submission, it has uh, all the markings of a court uh, essentially determining afresh, de novo, what it considers to be uh, in L's best interests. Uh, but first of all, it deals with uh, the uh, mother's request for deferral, which I needn't trouble my lord with. Secondly, the competence of the court relying principally on Article 9. Uh, she argues, going to page 88, that she moved and settled in Britain more than six months before uh, the respondent's appeal submission. Uh, my Lord, I should interject that I make uh, no, my, none of my grounds of appeal, our grounds of appeal rely specifically on Article 9. Uh, and uh, moreover, ni n neither do they um, in any way uh, seek to rely on Article 15, which is the next point that the court recites to halfway down page 88. Uh, my Lord, there's then reference to the mother not um, the, the mother filing um, uh, her application in the English court and the father's decision to um, appeal quotes before any debate before the Liverpool court. That's in dealing with what was uh, essentially an Article 12.2 prorogation argument that the mother deployed in the French Court of Appeal uh, and which I accept was deployed uh, by her through her legal team in the, in the hearing before Mr Justice MacDonald. Again, I do not, on, we do not on her behalf uh, make uh, any points in our grounds of appeal in respect of prorogation and Article 12. Um, my Lord, the decision on jurisdiction then, whereas the fact that the child speaks only English and has resided in Britain for more than one year and has integrated into Britain may not de facto lead to the application of Article 15, whereas there's no justification for the English French court to relinquish jurisdiction uh, and accordingly the challenge of territorial jurisdiction should be declared inadmissible. It, it then deals with the wealth, what might be called the welfare grounds um, for its decision dealing with calling it regarding parental authority in the section that starts at the bottom of page 88. Mr. Hems, I think you can take it that we've read this. Thank so you. You my can Lord. go through it quite my quickly. In that case, I won't take my Lord to the right. uh, salient passages, but what I do submit and what I uh, respectfully invite the, this court to collect from that analysis uh, is that it is um, focused on what the mother had done uh, since the first instance decision. It is not, as I've already alluded to, a, a critique of the first instance decision in French court in La Réunion. Uh, but more significantly, in our, in our submission, uh, it is not um, a full welfare analysis dealing with the points that I've already raised orally and that we've raised in our skeleton argument as to the impact on this child of, being, of having her main carer changed of having to leave uh, and having to endure a change of circumstances uh, by leaving England and travelling to La Réunion. And the, it, what we would submit is the inevitable harm 
that would flow from that. Uh, moreover, um, my lords, it does not appear uh, to give any weight to the recommendations of the social investigator uh, whose report and conclusions had influenced the first instance decision. I can just trouble my lords to go to that report. This is in the bundle at 282. My lord, this is a report dated the 22nd of January, and it must be 2019. There's a type, typographical error on the dating on page 293, which is the end of the report. I, I don't know whether my lords have had an opportunity of reading this report. We have, but take, it, take us through it, just highlighting what you want us to... Yes, by all means. My, draw to our attention. Uh, my lord, it refers to the... Um, biography of the parties refers to um, various interviews that the author had had um, with what might be called character referees uh, for both um, parties, some of them uh, overlapping in the sense that they give information about both parents. There is then, um, and that in fact takes up uh, a lot of the um, reports, but at 292 uh, is of particular re relevance to this appeal, uh, an analysis of the child herself. Uh, 292. See complimentary comments about her. Didn't see anything, suggest any mistreatment or neglect. Despite the language barrier, because Elle does not speak French, um, they, had, they the, the authors, had to speak uh, in English. Uh, and they, they report that having observed Elle um, with a mother, that they were living and, de and living, developing together. This is, the penul this is the final paragraph of that section. They report, we observe that Elle and her mother are clearly very close. They seek each other's well-being all the time. Uh, we also observe that the mother takes particularly good care of her daughter, responding to her least little demands. And this is as of uh, January 2019. Uh, and then the analysis and conclusion uh, accepts that both parents are able to offer love, tenderness, and affection, both able to provide her with a good education. Uh, and then, carrying on over the page, Elle's age, the fact that her mother has always taken care of her and the close bond that exists between them would make it difficult from the point of view of the child's stability to separate her uh, from her mother. Uh, and then accepting the last paragraph, respondent clearly able to offer L comfortable living conditions. However, mother asserts that in Britain, L would also have living conditions that are decent, conducive to her development. Uh, and that is the um, report that the first instance decision expressly refers to. Uh, and my Lord, uh, uh, I of course must accept that this court is not permitted to review the decision of the French Appeal Court, but I, I do make the observation, if I may, that there appears uh, no reference whatsoever and no analysis whatsoever of the conclusions and recommendations of the report that the French court itself had commissioned, a still less recognition of the impact that a change of custody, a enormous geographical change in circumstances would have on a child where the essential dispute on its face was one of management of contact. Uh, my yes. Lord. Thank you. My so is Lord. that the end of the supplementary bundle? Um, I, think it is, I think it is for now, my Lords. Right. Yes. My Lord, can I then move with, with that um, perhaps rather lengthy uh, introduction? Uh, can I then deal with the grounds in turn? 
Um, my Lord, uh, of course, I don't lose sight of uh, the observation that Lord Justice Peter Jackson made about ground two, uh, perhaps having um, more meat to it. But I propose to start with ground one um, for reasons that I hope are uh, apparent, because it is ground one which challenges the essential jurisdictional decisions of Mr. Justice MacDonald. Uh, and gra it's ground two that mo moves on uh, to demonstrate to this court that, in fact, Mr. Justice, Mr. Justice MacDonald had an oven-ready uh, solution to the very difficult problem that he was faced with. My Lords, we submit in Grand One essentially that Mr Justice MacDonald was wrong to find that the English court um, had no substantive jurisdiction as of the 17th of June, or if his uh, judgment can be read as finding that in fact the English court did have such a jurisdiction uh, that um, he was wrong not to have exercised uh, that jurisdiction uh, to consider and then determine uh, what is in L's uh, best interests. That uh, jurisdiction, briefly, um, was fixed, we would submit, by the fact that as of the 17th of June 2019, uh, that L was, at well, least by then, yes, officially I mean, resident. Isn't ground one really challenging uh, or focused on this pendants? Yes. Well, I think, yes, it is. What the judge but, says is it has no jurisdiction, but it would be appropriate to exercise. Yes. That, that's the Article 19 point. I, I, yes, it probably is. When, when, I confess, when we first read it, we weren't, it was whether the last few words of that qualify that sentence. But it seems, uh, and we propose to proceed with this appeal on the basis that he wasn't finding that there wasn't a jurisdiction in England. It was more that it was not appropriate for him to exercise it because of his finding that there was a Liz Pendens uh, because of the French Hill decision. Well, two. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, he proceeds on the basis that, that the habitual residence of L was in England by then. So Article 8 would normally give jurisdiction, but he says because of Article 19, it's not a jurisdiction that the court should exercise. Is it any more complicated than that? I... Probably not, my lord. I can. That's I think paragraph seventy, paragraph seventy nine, or um, eighty nine of the judgment. I look. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying because in the first sentence, of paragraph eighty, the judge says that um, for the purpose of Article eight, during the currency of a, a list or this pendants, does not act to confer jurisdiction. Yes. But he then goes on to say. Uh, um, that, uh, well, I, as I read it, that there was jurisdiction, but jurisdiction that um, should not be exercised during the course of the proceedings in uh, Réunion because of the provisions of Article 19. Yes, I, uh, that, 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 that's, I, I can see that. Um, my Lord, the, the reason why I just Query whether in fact Mr. is looking bemused even behind his mask. <laughs> so maybe he disagrees with that. We'll find out in due course. Um, my Lord, looking then at the discussion section yes. of his judgment, which starts at paragraph 78, which is page yes, uh, 70 uh, in the core of the yes. bundle. Yes. Um, the, one, the first uh, sentence I've already referred to. Um, uh, and then uh, well, it's pretty much an, an introductory um, introductory paragraph that expresses his overall view uh, but uh, at, at paragraph um, 79 he says in the second sentence um, well the first sentence I'm not able to accept the submissions of the mother uh, that the court of the reunion did not have jurisdiction and then in this context, he says, I'm prepared to proceed on the basis that at the time the mother issued her application in the English court, 
Leila was habitually resident uh, in the jurisdiction. Yes. yes. Uh, and then there's par paragraph 80, um, which is a paragraph we've mulled over. I, I'm satisfied that a change of a child's habitual residence for the purposes of Article 8 during the um, currency of a lease under Article 19 does not act to confer jurisdiction. My Lord, we would submit that there can be. No, I know, I, but uh, as my Lord has pointed out, he, okay. he, he then goes on to say, doesn't result, result automatically in that country having jurisdiction it can exercise. Yes, which is the, the next, the same, yeah. yes, so paragraph 80. I mean, if a child is habitually resident in a, in a state, then that state has jurisdiction. The subject yes. to the other provisions, including in particular Article 19. Well, so it's the exercise of the jurisdiction. Yes. Uh, as was pointed out below, Article 8 doesn't refer to Article 19 expressly. It refers to the subsequent paragraphs to uh, Article 8, so yes. 9, 10, 11. Quite, yeah. but it, it's, it's the exercise, yes. not the existence. Well, my Lord, I, I, I'm happy to proceed on, right. on, on on that basis, although there are other passages, perhaps I don't need to um, elaborate too much, but where it's, it's not absolutely clear that he has clearly in his mind the difference with respect to him, the difference in the acquisition. No, I, jurisdiction. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, my Lord, the um, core reason then why he, he finds that the um, French court retains jurisdiction appears to be his acceptance of the decision of the report yes. of the French expert. Yes. And my Lord, I, I the French expert's report is in the supplementary bundle. I, I wasn't going to take my Lord's to it. No, well, it, yes. And, and I mean, he, well, he accurately sets out what it in, says. In, indeed. And it, that wasn't disputed. Well, my Lord, yes. Um, it's right that um, the mother's legal team did not call the expert, did not um, ask for for her to be cross-examined and, and indeed did, did not challenge her. I have to accept that that was what happened in the court below. Yes. Um, my Lord, and Even in this court, there's no suggestion that you're applying for fresh evidence to say it was wrong. Or, I mean, well, my Lord, what? No, <laughs> I'm not making any application of that nature. Um, well, what I am saying, um, my Lords, is that Mr Justice MacDonald had uh, a duty uh, and we put it as high as that, a duty to consider his jurisdiction um, without reference to pleadings, which is how it was put in the ethical case. Um, he had to make his own decision. Uh, he was not bound by the French um, expert. Um, he had to construe what had happened um, in accordance with the autonomous law of the European instrument just as a court has to construe the 1980 Hague Convention and other international instruments according to the uh, autonomous uh, law given to the particular instrument in question. Uh, and had he done that, um, particularly bearing in mind the importance and the central feature of habitual residence uh, in Article 8 of the Convention, sorry, Article 8 of the Council Regulation, uh, and the recitals that emphasize the importance of proximity in any jurisdictional dispute. Um, he would have found that in these circumstances there couldn't possibly have been, as a matter of law, uh, a Article 19.2 lease, simply by virtue of a late appeal made uh, by the respondent to the French court. We don't have evidence, do we, that the appeal was out of time? We don't have specific evidence about that, although um, there is evidence that I can take my Lord's to of, of, of hearsay nature, that the mother in one of her witness statements, which is in the supplementary bundle, um, explains that her French solicitor told her that the limit was one month. The, the father's her, evidence was that the appeal was in time. Yes. Well, how do we resolve that? We, it's very difficult for us sitting here without any French evidence no. apart from a single expert who was not asked any further questions or cross-examined to go behind the statement is it that the, the, the court, French court remains seized throughout. I mean, that, 
Well, my Lord, my Lord I, I've accepted that, but I... I and is it, not also, is it not also difficult for us to come to a factual conclusion that the French appeal was out of time when the father's evidence is that he was told it was in time? But forgive me, I'm not inviting this court to make any factual determination of what French law is. I made but, that very you clear. Did, you did say that it was a late appeal, and I asked you if it was out of time. Well, How can we proceed? Well, we, if it was in time, then... Was it late in any important well, sense? My Lord, the, we submit that it was late, but I accept that I can't um, invite this court to, to determine an evidential dispute and, and of that point nature. And this was but, not taken before Mr Justice no, MacDonald? I, I, of course, yeah. see um, my learned friend's um, skeleton about that, and I have explained to him, and, and I will to the court, that I have to accept that. But my Lord, my point isn't factual. My point is that as a matter of law, um, there must, can I, can I put it this way, that there must come a time when uh, a court which has acquired jurisdiction by dint of a change of habitual residence uh, must uh, come to the view that it has the right to exercise that jurisdiction, notwithstanding what we still characterize, not, not in a technical sense, uh, but in a, a purposive construction sense that an appeal is made late. Because otherwise, my Lord, one could have appeals made perfectly properly, perhaps with permission to appeal out of time, perhaps not. Perhaps in jurisdictions where there is a very lengthy appeal process that could uh, enable a jurisdiction of a child's former habitual residence to limp on and on and on. Uh, and there must come a time we would submit uh, in accordance with a purpose of construction of the um, articles in the council regulation of the, in the preamble emphasizing the importance of proximity and the primacy of habitual residence in article 8 where uh, a court clearly uh, having jurisdiction because of article 8 must say that the previous court has exhausted its jurisdiction. Because otherwise, one could have theoretically appeals that are made extremely late. And it shouldn't be a matter merely of a um, question of fact. Yes, uh, the, trouble, the trouble is, uh, speaking for myself, is it, you're hitting a roadblock. The roadblock is the only evidence the judge had is that the uh, proceedings were pending before the French courts throughout the period up to May 2021. That's, that's and however uh, you say that list pendants in Article 19 might have, it's, has an autonomous meaning, uh, whatever the autonomous meaning is, it must relate to there being a list which is pending in another state. And you're up in, sort of inviting a court to say, well, we're going to decide there is no list pending in another state because enough time's gone by. Well, and it, and it, 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 I don't see how it can get you anywhere in this case when there isn't anything to ground a decision that there wasn't, there weren't proceedings pending in another state. Well, my, I, may I just say this, that if this court was sitting on the, if an English court was sitting on the, the 17th, or for that matter, the 18th of July, 2019, uh, it was very difficult for the court in those circumstances to determine whether there was a lease, because that then, from all um, outward appearance, there had been a final order of the French First Instance Court and no appeal, and some um, there are, there are four, ifs. four or five months I, I quite agree with you. There are ifs. There's no evidence about those ifs. Well, I accept the evidence is against me. Of course, I have to. But, um, there's, but, yes, but there's no evidence I, I can't see the evidence to build a submission that in fact uh, when the uh, mother started proceedings in this country in July 2009, 2019 there were not proceedings pending in another state but if, if that is right then a second court in 
where a child has changed habitual residence. There, there might, but, I, but there might be. You, you might have a situation where a court can say, no, there aren't any proceedings pending, so we do have jurisdiction. But then it might suddenly emerge, you know, maybe a year or two into the second court's um, exercise, investi welfare investigations, that an appeal is made out of time. But that's, and not, that, yes, but that's, that's not this case. Well, it's not this case, but it, it might have been this case. Um, if you the haven't English demonstrated court been, this case. Hmm? You haven't demonstrated this case, so there's no might about it. No, well, I, I accept that evidentially um, there was an appeal, what, within a, a month of the English court being seized. Um, my lord, my, my submission doesn't rest on whether that was permissible under French law one way or the other. But then well, my point is that the second court uh, cannot wait indefinitely before it embarks on a proper welfare investigation. Uh, and it, it can reasonably and safely and quite properly take it that where a f uh, after four months where a court of first instance order has been not only made but acted upon and in this sense executed on because the mother uh, in fact had moved here with L, that, that it cannot in those circumstances simply uh, decline to exercise what is a proper jurisdiction. Uh, my Lord, they, I have I've tried to tempted to draw comfort from the Court of Appeal decision uh, on the divorce point where points were made on the pleadings not identifying uh, properly a proper jurisdictional path to an English court entertaining a divorce and the Court of Appeal making very, this court making very clear that there was an independent duty regardless of the state of the pleadings uh, I, I, to establish its jurisdiction. And, and you're saying as of the 17th of July 2019, there was no dispendence. Yes. That's what you would have to establish. And then we turn to the only evidence in this case, which is to the effect that the application is considered to be pending throughout the period. Yes. My Lord, in those circumstances, my Lords have my points. I'll, I'll move on to um, grant you. Perhaps before I do, there's the simply this point from Purica, which uh, I know yes. my lord seen that Purica. It's a different. The the main decision was on a different point, so I don't, I don't propose uh, to take um, my lord to it in any great detail give me a moment I can't seem to locate it there's a, there's a paragraph that deals with where um, the second court seized um, is satisfied that the first court uh, has exercised its jurisdiction and concluded uh, its jurisdiction that it then has a duty uh, to exercise its welfare jurisdiction. Yeah, sorry. Well, because it has in those circumstances yes, uh, nothing on which to stay them because yeah. the dispendence provisions don't apply. Exactly. But my, my, my point is that it emphasises the CJHEAU's... The duty on the court. Du duty on the court. Yes. Uh, and emphasises how primary jurisdiction still rests with the court where the child is habitually resident. My Lord, I, I'm not, I can't... Is it paragraph I can't take eight? it any further than that. Is it paragraph 82 of the judgment? Yes, yes it's 82. So if the second... Court second seized has no information supporting the existence of an action brought before another court, then it's the duty of that court to proceed with consideration of the action. Yes. But in this case, of course, the second court seized, or well, certainly Mr. Justice MacDonald did, did have information. The, the, yes. The, the, the French court was still seized until yes. conclusion of the appeal process. But 
But he, but he also knew that effectively, and I, I'll just make this point, I'm not sure how far it goes, um, but the, 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 the appeal order, as I've already submitted, has all the hallmarks of a, of a fresh look at matters. It's not Does that a matter? critique. Does that matter? Well, um, my lord, only that it offends the, the cardinal um, principles of the council regulation, that it's the courts where a child is habitually resident who are best placed and ought to determine what is in a child's Well, th there's interest. a number of European principles. Obviously, there's that one. But there's also that you don't want to have jurisdictional disputes between two courts of two member states yes. going on at the same time. Once one court in one member state has assumed jurisdiction, it's the duty of a court in a second state to decline jurisdiction if the proceedings are pending. And that's, there are perfectly sound reason, policy reasons for that as well. Yes. But also, the fact that you, you've said it a number of times, that the fact that the appeal in, in this other state is a de novo reconsideration, that's not unusual. The fact that we think that appeals are reviewed a, might be regarded as a parochial English view on how appeals should work. Many, many countries appeals work de novo. So what, what I don't understand, you've said it a couple well, of times as if, as if it's a criticism or something, and I don't, I don't buy it at all. It, it, it's simply a feature that what the French court did amounts to the exercise of a welfare jurisdiction de novo um, when, under the council regulation, it should be the court of habitual residence that exercises the primary welfare jurisdiction. Um, if there was an appeal process, um, it would be harder for me to make the argument because, I mean, appeal process in, in, the, in, in the English sense, because the appeal court would be correcting the earlier exercise of that welfare jurisdiction when plainly, unarguably, uh, the reunion court had jurisdiction by dint of habitual residence under Article 8. You're assuming that means that somehow in under French law, appeals should be like our appeals, not like their appeals. Well, no, that's, no, like that's, that's not my, with respect, that's not my, that's not my primary point, not, not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that it has the hallmarks of the French court um, exercising a fresh, a different jurisdiction uh, when the French court of first instance had already uh, finished, exhausted the French jurisdiction by making uh, a final order that, that still stood it wasn't corrected in the sense that it wasn't criticised or reversed. Well, it was reversed. Well, exactly. the, the impact of it. The impact of it was. But I mean, there's no doubt the French Court of Appeal was hearing an appeal from the first instance proceedings. Uh, uh, the the nature of the appeal was by way of rehearing, as you've shown us. But it wasn't exercising a jurisdiction, as it were, of its own initiative as a first instance court, it was hearing an appeal from the decision of the first instance court in Saint-Denis at a time when, the, as you've said, the child's habitual residence was in the reunion. And your point is, by the time it comes to the Court of Appeal, the child's habitual residence is in England, and therefore, if it was starting afresh, it didn't have the habitual residence to ground its jurisdiction. But what grounds its jurisdiction is it's hearing an appeal from a decision of the High Court in St. Denis. My Lord, my point is that it proceeded not looking at what the situation was when the first instance court was dealing with matters, but looking at matters um, afresh that had occurred since the jurisdiction had been exhausted uh, in France because of the first instance decision. That, that, that's, my only, um, that's my only point about that. But my Lord, may I perhaps move on? Um, and my Lord's um, references to the other principles of the council regulation perhaps bring me neatly to ground two, and particularly Article uh, 23E, which, which is an example of where the council regulation, uh, as interpreted and construed by Lord Justice Peter Jackson in Re, among other cases, uh, enables uh, a court subsequently exercising a welfare jurisdiction to be able to embark on that sort of welfare determination, make an order, and then um, refuse or decline, despite the principles of mutual respect <coughs> for other courts' decisions, uh, to 
register for enforcement that earlier decision. Uh, and um, we submit that that was plainly something that Mr. Justice MacDonald considered, because he considered it. There's a, there's a lengthy, um, there's three passages, I think, in his um, different places in his judgment um, where he considers <coughs> the re approach. Um, but uh, he declines, we would submit, uh, to make a full and proper investigation uh, into L's welfare by um, essentially confining and fettering his discretion by only looking at a change of circumstances uh, since the appeal hearing as if he was a, a variation court. Whereas Article, Article 8 doesn't uh, in any way, or none of the subsequent articles, confine a court exercising its duty to exercise a primary welfare jurisdiction to consider a change of circumstances. Now, that's not to say that in any given case, on any given facts, that um, a, a court may only uh, be required to look at what's happened recently. But, my Lord, in this case, on the facts of this case, uh, we submit quite boldly that that was, and boldly, that that was, an, um, that was a fettering of his discretion that is entirely inappropriate uh, on the facts uh, and circumstances of this case, uh, particularly uh, bearing in mind what, in fact, uh, the French appeal court had purported to do. Of course, he was entitled and had a duty to give that all due respect. But equally, and Puraka essentially tells us this, he also, uh, and we would submit, this is a higher duty to consider what was in the best interests of L in the circumstances that he found them to be. Uh, if he didn't have sufficient welfare material, he should have sought it. Uh, we submit that he had uh, sufficient welfare material. I've taken my lords to um, the, not only the psychotherapist report in May in this jurisdiction, uh, but also the very helpful social inquiry report uh, made in France uh, in January of 2019, uh, as well as the mother's own statements as to, Lay's, to, uh, to Elle's life. Just to complete the catalogue, I won't, don't need to take my lords to them. Uh, he also had some evidence from the uh, nursery that it was becoming fast becoming L's reception class uh, as to her welfare in this jurisdiction. He also had material in the mother's um, witness statement as to how impossible or almost impossible uh, she would find it uh, to return to La Réunion or spend any significant periods of time uh, in La Réunion. So those are all matters that um, we submit he failed to give really any weight to, any consideration to, because he was simply looking at the change of circumstances that um, he observed had occurred since, um, since October 2020. Do we, did he have evidence as to whether the mother would have a right of entry to France, a right of residence in France? Um, he didn't have any expert evidence. I have to accept that. Oh, I mean, the mother said she couldn't afford it, um, but that's a different point. Is it? Yes. Was well, there evidence as to immigration? She, she, she expressed um, in supplement, supplementary bundle 271, paragraph 17, and this is, I accept, this is her evidence. It's not expert evidence, but nonetheless, it's, it is evidence. Sorry, which page? Sorry. 271 in, yes, 271. Both, both on the print, yeah, printed page.
Paragraph 17. 17. I could not move to La Réunion. Do not have a visa. Understanding is that I need a holiday visa. Only enter for a few months. Not allowed to work there. And then she says she and doesn't then, have the financial resources. Yes. She doesn't speak French. Yes. Exactly. And and she'd have to leave if she had a tourist visa. Yes. And, and while we're here, um, my lords, par paragraph 12 uh, raises some of the other in evidence, some of the other welfare concerns that plainly needed to be investigating, investigated. I won't list them all, but it is evidence that Mr. Justice um, McDonald doesn't appear to have taken into account at all. And so what, your, what the mother was saying in paragraph 17 was, uh, theoretically, um, I might be able to go there on a holiday visa, but I don't have the resources that would enable me to go, and certainly not have the resources to enable me to uh, stay. Yes. And in paragraph 12, she's highlighting uh, the passage of time since the uh, French uh, substantive order of October 2020, during which uh, the child has become more established in England and Wales. Yes, and that she would find it incredibly distressing and emotionally damaging uh, if she were to, to leave her mother's care. And points out the few people she knows in La Réunion. Uh, points to the members of the paternal family who live in London. My Lord, I didn't take my Lords to this point, but I'm on it. But in the French social inquiry report, in the interviews with the father, he accepts that he has, at that time, whether they're still here, I don't know, but at that time he had two brothers living in, in, in this jurisdiction. And, and my lord, she, over the there's um, difficulties with school, paragraph 14, about her inability to speak French. Paragraph 15, she doesn't know father's partner or her children. Was that a development since the order in October 2020? I don't remember that being referred to. In other words, that the father had a uh, partner who he was living with and children. I, I don't think it's mentioned in the French decision from recollection. And none will go to uh, Miss Justice MacDonald's judgment in a moment. And my lords, at, at, at paragraph 16, she expresses concern about how he would manage uh, the full-time care, uh, emphasizing that he's a very busy man. I mean, he, there's no dispute that he's a very successful surgeon, and successful surgeons are, are very busy surgeons. And, well, and your, your, as I understand your submission is, is that the circumstances as they were when the case was being considered by Mr. Joseph MacDonald in, uh, no, when was the hearing? Anyway, November, December 2021. November, I think. November, the November December 2021. Yeah. Were very different from the circumstances being considered by the court in France in October, in Réunion, France, in October 2020, or August 2020. Oh, I, I'm con I think I'm constrained to put it that way, but, um, we say that you know, those, those circumstances are factors that should be taken into account. Whether or not they are strictly a change or otherwise. Well, I, I, I wasn't putting it that way. I wasn't used, did, did I use the word change? I'm not sure, I might have used the word change. Sure. But what you're just saying is the, the, the factual situation was different. Another uh, 12, 14 months had elapsed during which things had happened such as, as I said, the child becoming more established, the father's life changing 
And you're saying those are relevant considerations when the court is deciding whether or not to exercise its welfare jurisdiction. Yes. I, I say they're all relevant circumstances. I, I'm all, I'll go on to submit that if, if this court determines that it's necessary um, for me to demonstrate that they were a change, well, well plainly, uh, circumstances in November 14 months after the judgment, 13 months after the judgment, and, and 15 months after the, the hearing, for a child of this age, uh, are rapidly changing. But my Lord, I, I don't want to lose focus on my, my central submission that, that these are such important circumstances that it shouldn't be with respect for me to show there's a change. But we submit that he was wrong to constrain himself simply to trying to identify some sort of change that justified um, a, a different order. Can I ask, of course, this because you said a little while ago that he had a duty to give the French court's order all due respect. Due respect. Yes. Now, what do you mean by that? If it's not necessary to show that the circumstances are different, to use my lord's phraseology, but suppose the circumstances, suppose he was sitting the day after the French court handed down its order, and the circumstances were identical, what would he be in Title to do while still giving the French court's order all due respect? Could he simply say, well, they thought this, but I think that? I, he would at the very least have to give reasons for why he was departing, I suppose, from the conclusions that they had reached. But that, in this case, we would suggest would be quite a, a straightforward proposition because plainly, on its face, um, the, the French court was concerned uh, not so much with the impact on L, but on what it perceived to be the mother's jurisdictional tactics, for lack of a better word, uh, and the, the issue of, of contact, which plainly was exercising it. Uh, it it's in the same way that um, to, to use a different analogy, that, that courts uh, should respect, for example, recommendations of, of experienced CAF gas officers. Ultimately, the duty is theirs to make the appropriate decision, giving respect and explaining why they are departing from a recommendation. Now, it, it may be that um, one way of departing from recommendation is simply to say, well, the circumstances have changed something there's been a development or it may be that a judge is emboldened but entitled to say well uh, I've considered all of the factors and I've seen material perhaps that the French court didn't see but at any rate uh, I've looked at the evidence now and it, it's very plain to me that it would not simply by a fine margin be uh, in the best interests of L to stay in this country. But the alternative is so, we submit, so traumatic, which the judge easily have found based on the impact of a change of carer and a change of circumstances in the sense that it's used in the welfare checklist on L is such that by a, a pretty wide margin, I, I'm satisfied that the correct order now is for L to remain in this jurisdiction, notwithstanding what my brother judge in La Réunion has determined 14 months ago, whatever it was. But I think you would go so far as to say, even if it wasn't 14 months ago, even if the circumstances were exactly the same, it was still the duty of the English court to at least consider whether to have a full welfare investigation. Well, there may be other circumstances. There may be, he may um, appraise the circumstances differently. It's a qualitative judgment as much as a well, that, that's why I ask quantitative. Whether you judgment. go so far as to say it's enough for the English judge to say, well, they thought that, but I think this. 
because I have difficulty reconciling that with the idea that you have to give the French court's order all due respect. I mean, well, I, I think I may perhaps I should just qualify that slightly by saying that that's I, I was then referring to one of the principles of the council regulation that that's where one identifies and locates this this duty of mutual um, respect mutual consideration um, I mean it would be not respectful for Mr. Justice McDonald to say I completely ignore the French decision um, but showing uh, as with the Kafkas officer's recommendation uh, one can show respect to the recommendation and then depart from it. I suppose uh, it's emphasizing, or the judge would need to emphasize in his reasoning um, as to why he's come to a different view. And that's really what it boils down to. What I'm struggling with, the obviously candid, is why that amounts to respect for a, for a judicial decision. I think I'm so sorry. I didn't. I don't understand why what you're describing amounts to giving any respect at all, to be absolutely well, blunt, to a judicial decision. Because what you're saying is that the second court comes to its own conclusion. Well, he comes. Yes, he has a duty to reach his own con conclusion, giving respect to the. And it's irrespective of the decision of the first court. Well, giving respect to the judgment as he considers appropriate in all the circumstances is, is perhaps. I, I, my lord's point about the difference um, in a in the treatment of appeals. Uh, I mean, there was a time when effectively, in certain appeals in this jurisdiction, uh, a judge was said to, could, could, could exercise discretion afresh, could make um, inferences as, as he or she thought fit, whilst paying respect to the decision of the earlier or the, the, the court below. Um, and really what that amounted to was explaining fully why he had taken a different view. Yes, but this, this, this isn't an appeal from the court in France. This no. Is, this is two, exactly. two sovereign states and the courts of those sovereign states which are supposed to be giving respect to each other's decisions in order to avoid uh, jurisdictional problems where you, the second court says, well, I think I think we should do this, which is different from what, what you've just done. And what does the first court do? Go back and say, well, I think we should do what I said. Well, it, it's showing respect in the context of the of the um, articles in the council regulation, which, uh, as I've already submitted, specifically enable a court, and I'm look, I'm referring to Article 23E, mm -hmm. specifically enable a, a court in, in another jurisdiction to reach a different welfare decision. I mean, that's there on, on the face of the, of the council regulation, whilst, of course, showing respect and in some cases, the, the respect may be simply a veneer of, of respect. I, I think I'd have to accept that. But in other cases, um, there may need to be a, a, a real in-depth analysis um, of the decision-making process, the evidence, the circumstances that the earlier court had taken into account. Um, each, each case will, will change um, or will depend on its own particular facts and circumstances. I certainly don't submit that respect means slavishly follow, that there has to be a qualitative uh, assessment made, because that's the duty of the court. And as I repeat, the council regulation, Article 23E, when it comes to the, the, the mutual, inf mutual respect showed to when considering enforcement of each other orders specifically allows for that. And it's there, really, that the, the, the mutual the overriding principle of mutual respect uh, is particular, particularly resonates when one is operating Article 23 grounds for non-registration. Yet Article 23E expressly allows uh, a, a court of subsequent jurisdiction uh, to make a, a wholly different order to the, to the earlier decision of the first state with habitual residence and then um, refuse to recognize. Uh, and that is um, a path open to any judge under the council regulation. Uh, and in this case, was specifically uh, an oven-ready solution um, that he considered. And there's no doubt that 
Mr Justice MacDonald did consider that. Uh, and we submit that his treatment of, of that case was, was wrong, enabling this court to interfere and to determine that there should now be a welfare determination in accordance with the solution operated by or, or suggested by and commended by uh, Lord Justice Peter Jackson. My Lord's you're taking us to that now. I was just going to say that that may be the the, the next step on my journey, uh, my lord. So I think you might be alighting two stages in the process. One is, the first is whether it's appropriate to embark on a welfare assessment at all. And you say in this case the judge wrongly fettered his discretion because he used the expression "change of circumstances," which I think your your submission is that there were developments were changes, but he, na he unduly narrowed his focus. The second stage is, if the court does go on uh, and conduct a welfare assessment, the place that the foreign court's decision has in that process. And there are two different stages. If Shall we have a look at re -E? Yes. Um, all right. My Lord, the perhaps I can take my Lord to some of the opening observations of um, the right at the beginning of the uh, judgment. Which uh, I, of course, accept. Um, at paragraphs 2 and paragraph 3, there is, with respect, an authoritative um, statement of the principles under the section overview of the of all, of, of all international instruments concerning children, but particularly well, except the council that, Yes, sorry, go on. Particularly the council regulations. Yes, but except that the 1996 Hague Convention uh, addresses specifically the move of a child, the move of a child's habitual residence during the course of proceedings. And in those circumstances, the Hague Conference um, guide to uh, the 96 Convention suggests that the original court cons could, should consider yeah. transferring jurisdiction to the yeah. next court. So it's, it, the 1996 Convention is structured differently because it recognises there might be good reason for transferring yes. jurisdiction uh, when the child's habitual residence has moved even during the course of yes. proceedings. There doesn't have the concept of perpetuity of poor rights. No, I, I of course accept that, but my, uh, my point really was that the, the common purpose is pretty similar. My Lord has that paragraph two. Yes. These instruments, I was perhaps taking it too quickly, these instruments have the common purpose promoting international cooperation for the benefit of children and avoiding conflicts of jurisdiction. Yes. But then again, alluding to the, the tension that that sometimes creates, treating the best interests of children as a primary consideration, of course, not a paramount consideration, as an English court would exercising domestic jurisdiction, uh, the instruments provide a mechanism for the mutual recognition of judicial decisions so that a judgment in one participating state is to be recognized and enforced in another participating state in effect as if it was a domestic judgment given in that state. And then at paragraph three, some submissions that I've on the, the issue of general jurisdiction and how long it continues, which I've already made um, submissions on it. And then just picking up over the page, one has the references to the, the mutual trust that courts should have for each other in, in, in the European subject of the council regulation. Uh, and there's a point I haven't yet made, but I respectfully should. And specified exceptions should be kept to a minimum. 
In particular, the substance of a judgment given in the first state may not be reviewed in the second state. And finally, the process of recognition and enforcement is to be carried out without delay. Uh, my Lord, nothing um, I submit uh, is, is intended uh, to, uh, as an attempt uh, to persuade this court um, in a technical sense to review the substance of the French appeal court in that sense. And nonetheless, um, as my lords will know, um, Lord Justice Peter Jackson still approved the making of a welfare order in this jurisdiction and approved uh, the consequential um, rejection of the application for registration under Article 23. Uh, subsection E. My lords, the, there, 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 is, there is much, of course, in, in, in the judgment, and I know my lord was a, a member of the Constitution, so I don't propose to, to deal with the authoritative description of the process in this jurisdiction. Um, but then moving on to page 207 in the Authorities Bundle and paragraph 53 um, is analysis of 23E. It is the clear aim of B2A to ensure that there's clarity about which court has jurisdiction, the power to make welfare orders uh, about children. This is his general introductory um, sentence. I don't need to trouble my lords with Article 20. And then he poses the questions that arose in that case. Uh, and they, are, they have resonance in this case. The first question is this, that whether the court, Mr. Justice MacDonald, faced with an enforcement application and a welfare application was obliged to prioritize the former and stay the latter so that the non-recognition provision of Article 23E could not be engaged unless and until recognition enforcement was refused for some other reason. And then two, if the court has no obligation to prioritise, how should it approach the two applications? Uh, my Lord, I, I don't need to say anything more about the second submission or the second issue because Lord Justice Peter Jackson, uh, essentially with, with my Lord, uh, this court um, determined that there was no obligation to prioritise one over the other. Uh, his answer to the first issue uh, then proceeds um, over the page with him making some general points that I, I needn't um, uh, emphasize uh, at this stage. As they essentially give, I think, seven or eight reasons um, why it's not necessary to prioritize. Paragraph 65 on page 211. develops the, the analysis of the second question. So what is the proper approach where an English court, as it was in this case, is required to deal with the concurrent applications for recognition enforcement of welfare orders? Where this arises, the power to make welfare orders may be theoretically unfettered. Theoretically unfettered. But in practice, it is subject to important constraints First one, the courts are required to comply with recognition enforcement provisions of B2A. And um, in approaching the grounds for non-recognition, the court must always recall, I think I used that term in my earlier submissions, but the court, that's the obligation to recall the principle of mutual trust or comity contained in recital 21 uh, and remain mindful that the recognition enforcement process is not a welfare process. Um, that's looking at the appeal specifically. He goes on further, the grounds contained uh, in E and F differ from the other grounds. We don't need to concern ourselves with F, but E is different um, precisely because they do not involve a process of assessment by the court, the requested court but can in certain cases be engaged as a result of the action taken by the court itself. Um, if 
I may respectfully adopt this for reasoning in addition to my earlier submissions to my Lord's uh, questions of me about what mutual respect actually means. Uh, I'll gladly do so. So he continues in paragraph 67, the scheme and spirit of the regulation requires the court to act with restraint before exercising its powers in a way that sets up a barrier to enforcement. Uh, and then he gives the familiar example often encountered by judges sitting in the family court where contact does not take place and an enforcement application is made. It is then met by an application to vary the order without there being any real change of circumstances. Uh, my Lord, it's, it's tolerably clear that this is where Mr. Justice MacDonald um, found the principle, or what he thought to be a principle, that his welfare determination was constrained uh, by merely a consideration of a change of circumstances. Um, of course, the facts in this case make uh, this example we would submit inappropriate. Um, firstly, the variation, putting in inverted commas, because it wasn't strictly a variation application, but the application by the mother was not a response to the enforcement application. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, the matter before Mr. Justice MacDonald was not simply a, a matter of the question of enforcing or varying contact, but to dis determining the crucial question of where a child should live uh, and with whom a child should, should make her primary home. In fact, her only home, given the geographical uh, distance. But nonetheless, um, of course, it must be right that the court, I carry on from towards the bottom of the page, the court has the power to hear the variation of a application, but is likely to see it for what it is, merely an attempt to frustrate the enforcement of a valid order. It will not allow it to proceed to a full hearing because they, that would involve the inappropriate relitigation of issues that have already been decided. Or to another way, it would be an impermissible review of the substance of the earlier decision. In contrast, where the variation application is based upon some apparently significant change of circumstances, the court may well decide to entertain it on its merits alongside the enforcement application. Uh, at all events, neither application has automatic precedence. It will depend on the circumstances. Uh, and this is a conventional assessment for specialist family judges. Um, my Lord, this, this must, of course, be read in line with the, the Purika duty that I've already referred to. My Lord, plainly a decision has to be taken in the light of all of the circumstances of the case. And that must, we would respectfully submit, uh, include a consideration of all the relevant factors, uh, as would be required by Section 1 of the Children Act uh, and the Welfare Checklist. And we've alluded already to questions of harm, questions of child's wishes, feelings, and the impact of a change of circumstances. My Lord, I won't, I won't rehearse those again. Uh, my Lord, we submit that paragraph 67 shouldn't be read as, as requiring some sort of filter or preliminary assessment as to whether there has been a, a change of circumstances. And Whilst there may be two different issues, as, as my Lord has, has observed, uh, essentially it's, it's one consideration of whether it is appropriate to embark on a welfare investigation, given the history of the case, including the litigation history, but also, as I've emphasized, the particular facts and circumstances of a particular child. In the particular circumstances, uh, as they appear at the date of that consideration. When is it appropriate for the court to proceed?
proceed to a full hearing of the welfare question and when is it appropriate for the court to decline to do so? Each case is going to depend on the circumstances but there were enough I can only speak of this case there was enough in this case known to the court to recognize that the consequences uh, of this particular child in these particular circumstances of not being permitted to remain in this country but having to travel abroad to a completely different country, different language and different carer was sufficient. Uh, my Lord, uh, I'd respectfully submit that there is no need to particularly draw a line uh, as to how a set of circumstances should be judged because it will need to be very fact specific on the individual circumstances of the particular child in question. What, what Lord Justice Peter Jackson in 3E suggests in paragraph 67 was that on one side of the line, but admittedly he's talking about a, a, a variation application in, in response to an enforcement application, yeah. and you've made the point that's not this case, but he draws a distinction between a case where it's inappropriate relitigation of issues that have already been decided, an impermissible review of the substance of the previous decision on the one hand, and a case where there's some apparently significant change of circumstances on the other. Why is that not a, a, an adequate explanation of where the line should be drawn in a case like the present? Because the duty on the court is still to make a welfare determination having regard to all of the circumstances. But does, uh, and does, uh, does that lead to the consequence that, that the court should embark on a full welfare consideration in every case where it's asked to do so, notwithstanding an earlier decision of a foreign court, but one which, which prima facie, this court should, the English court should recognise? Uh, it would be much easier where there is an, uh, an obvious and clear change of position. I, of course, accept that because then one wouldn't need to be in any way critical or departing from the recommendation or the, the order. I mean, you, are, you are treating, the, in some of your submissions, the French court's order as if it was just a recommendation. It's not, it's an order. No, I, a, I misspoke. Of course yes. it's an order. It's an order which prima facie one is meant to give recognition to you in a spirit of mutual committee. I, and I, I was only referring to a welfare officer's yes. recommendation yes by way of analogy to, to yeah. yeah, thank you, deal with the question of respect. Mm. Um, so, may I, to what extent is the reasoning in paragraph 67 dependent on the fact that in the case before the court there, the Spanish court, the previous court, was not seen? Well, one, of, one of the critical things about re-e was that the, that the earlier court had ceased to be seen. Mm -hmm. So what the court was considering in re-e was a situation in which there was an order, a court of competent jurisdiction had made an order, but it wasn't seized anymore. Well, and that's the context in which this takes place. And the question I'm asking you is, in terms of the principles articulated in 67, how much are they affected by that circumstance? Well, that, that's not a difficulty for me in this case, because it's common ground that at the time of this hearing, Mr Justice MacDonald would have been satisfied that the French court was no longer seized. So, um, I see. whether that's oh, a, I've forgotten that. I, I, no, I see. I've forgotten. Wh whether that is a a requirement or not, I the, there seems no particular reason in principle why that should be a precondition. Um, the, the 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 date yeah. of seizure, but I, I I suppose if in this case the French court was still seized, it, it would inevitably mean that the English court. Couldn't, didn't have a jurisdiction if the Article no, 19 point I, I had forgotten that, 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 that it oh. was not seized at the time of mm -hmm. Mr Justice Fennell's decision. That was what was behind my question. So you, you've well, answered it very quickly. I, I'll, I'll hear what my learned friend has to say <laughs> about that in, in due course, but, but we, we submit that um, that is not, there, is, yeah. there is no real principled um, distinction between the approach uh, in Rui and this case. 
Although, of course, the facts are different. Um, Ms. Justice, Ms. Justice Russell was, was faced with a, a clear, we would suggest, uh, a clear difficulty from the perspective of child welfare uh, in recognizing and then enforcing um, a previous order. Uh, and the, the fact that it, it might have been made longer ago is a point of difference, but not of distinction. Except that they were teenage children, and this case does not involve a teenage child. Again, that is, in my submission, a difference without a distinction. It could be said in this case that the time that L has, has lived in this country uh, is a higher proportion of her life than with teenagers, uh, and moreover, the time that has passed since the French court made its decision. Uh, is a significant proportion of, of her life with this particular carer in these particular circumstances. So it, it is difficult, uh, and we conclude impossible, to draw any material difference, material difference, distinction uh, between Rui and this case. Um, well, the. the the conclusions, or the uh, might even say ratio of the decision, is in paragraph seventy-six. Yes, pulling this seventy-six, um, yes. which is where uh, he deals with the um, structure. I think that he proposes a court should follow. Yes. So the first one is, do you have jurisdiction to, do you have an exercisable jurisdiction, I think, isn't that what yes. one is really at, about? Yes. And, and the second is, if you do, then you have to decide whether or not to embark on a welfare assessment. Yes. And your submission in this case is the judge was wrong in respect of his decision not to embark on a welfare assessment. That's why I was saying it, it's... Because and, and, and less than until you've had a welfare assessment that results in an order which is different to the French order, you haven't got irreconcilable judgments. So you have to go through the process before you can determine whether you have irreconcilable judgments. And what Lord Justice Peter Jackson talks about in the manner in which the court conducts its exercises, he said the court is conducting a different exercise. It's a welfare exercise during the course of which uh, the court takes into account the Spanish, in that case, judgments into consideration as the court has the whole picture. So that's because, as I say, you're, it's, you, you don't get to 23E until you have an irreconcilable judgment. We don't yet have an irreconcilable judgment. You're yeah. saying you're, you're anticipating that there would be or will be, but that depends on the outcome of the welfare assessment and investigation and determination. Well, ado adopting. Um, well, no, I'm not. not to, it, this is what I. That's my reading of one, two, three, and four. Do, do you disagree with that? No. The question then for Mr. Justice MacDonald is um, why did he not have a welfare investigation, or rather, perhaps put more um, accurately, why did he confine uh, his consideration of whether there should or should not be a welfare consideration solely by reference to what he perceived and then went on to analyze to be a question of change of circumstances? Well, as I say, I think your first submission is there has been, uh, because of the age of the child, the development, there had been changes which warranted uh, the court embarking on a welfare assessment. Yes. But I understand your submission that focusing on change uh, might be said to be too narrow because the phrase or the approach in paragraph two is whether and to what extent it was appropriate yeah. to embark on. And that 
obviously depends on the particular circumstances of the yes. case, including yeah. a change of circumstances. Yes, I don't think I can dispute or quarrel with respect any of that, but he didn't. All he did was to confine himself to a, a, a essentially summary um, assessment of change of circumstances. He did not consider um, the information that I've, um, in my, my opening part of my submissions, went through the supplemental bundle. He, he simply confined himself to um, a, a summary perusal of what, what my, his view of what had happened since the French order was made. I mean, plainly, if there had been a development, um, I mean, that would have made it far easier. Um, I can and I do submit that you know, by dint of the child going to school, by dint of the child becoming so much older in proportion to her life, you know, that is a sufficient change of circumstances to justify a far fuller welfare investigation. Um, one of the other factors that he might have considered was the extent um, of the welfare information available to the French Court of Appeal, which uh, no information about at all, which is in glaring contrast to the evidence that he, he would have had from the earlier French Special Inquiry report. There's a danger of trespassing into the impermissible area of reviewing the substance of the French Court of well, Appeal's decision. And, and what this, what Reed makes claim is, is that's not what you're doing. No. That you're not entitled to do that. And, and, and the convention says you're not entitled to do that. But you're entitled to, to consider whether you need to investigate further. Which I think it was, my, my, as yes. I understood it, my, my Lord's point. Well, yes. I mean, picking up what my Lord said, the paragraph 76 two, the question is posed on what the judge should have asked whether and to what extent it's appropriate in the light of the Spanish order, which had to be recognised unless the appeal succeeded, but to, to embark on the welfare consideration. Because there will clearly be cases where in the light of a foreign order, it's not even appropriate to embark on it. But when you look at what Lord Justice Peter Jackson refers to, he says the facts of this case, the age and the wishes of the children the length of their habitual residence in the country, the length of time since the most recent Spanish orders, they're not put in a box marked change of circumstances. No. They're, they're all the facts of the case, and that's your point. Thank you. Yes, I think that, that, that is right. Because there are the, in any given case, there, there will be a whole range of circumstances. <coughs> and plainly in that case... There were some very, very clear factors that indicated that not only was there a need for a full welfare investigation, but frankly, the outcome of an English welfare determination was going to be quite different. Well, these obviously are much older children who have yes. expressed quite strong views of their own. Of course. And, well, and, and what age is it appropriate to ask a child in this country as to their own wishes? Obviously not at the age of two or three. Well, I mean, all one could say all children have feelings, but the, the usual, in, in Hague Convention cases for child's objections, it's around six or seven. If, if, there, if you've got a group of siblings and you're seeing an older child, then you may have wishes or, or more, more to the point, feelings of younger children. Um, this, this, this child now would probably be towards the, the youngest part of the range. But uh, I would be submitting that this child plainly has feelings, if not fully articulated wishes. Um, how much weight are to be given with those child's feelings, of course, is, is a matter for uh, the overarching discretionary exercise that family judges have to, have to perform. Um, but in this case, in that case, the, the magnetic feature, if I can borrow that phrase, was the children's mature wishes and feelings. In this case, it's the dramatic and potentially harmful 
uh, and we say potentially traumatic change in the child's circumstances. Plainly a particular matter referred to in the welfare checklist. Uh, and that um, is a magnetic feature that we submit should have undoubtedly led the judge to at least embark on the welfare uh, investigation. Can I go back to a, a point you uh, made earlier? You, you were referring to the extent of the welfare information available to the French Court of Appeal. And uh, there might well be cases in which uh, uh, courts, um, the subsequent court or later court, has completely different evidence, even relating to matters that were considered by the first court, and that happens in, in this country, and decisions are set aside on the basis of new evidence or new information. Mm. So that's why I suspect, again speaking for myself, Lord Justice Peter Jackson was not, was not saying change of, I, I suppose you could put new evidence in as a category of change of circumstances, but he was looking very broadly and saying you've got to decide whether the circumstances are such that it's appropriate. And that might include new evidence, new information. You might have new medical evidence. You might have all sorts of new evidence uh, which uh, go to a child's welfare, which justify the court embarking on a welfare investigation or assessment. And I suspect that's why one of the reasons why he wasn't uh, narrowly confining it. And so you, your submission would yes. be it's relevant to look at the welfare information available to a court when deciding not whether to recognize it, but deciding whether or not to embark on a separate welfare inquiry. Yes. If, if one is looking at it in that structured way that that's the approach that Lord Justice Peter Jackson recommends. Whether it's, um, it's intended as, a, as some sort of precondition before the court can ever embark on a welfare determination is, is another point. I mean, Lord, inevitably, the court will need to take a view in its own welfare assessment as to how much of a further investigation it will need to make. And that will in turn be informed by the nature of the investigation at any rate of the of the other court we would we would submit. Uh, if, if looking at the outcome in this case, well obviously uh, just putting to one side that for the moment the uh, prospect that the appeal might not succeed. If the appeal were to succeed, uh, what order you, do you submit we should make? Having regard to what is set out in paragraph 76 of re E. Well, my Lord, the, the options would be for, I think it would probably be difficult in, in practical terms for this court uh, to embark on the welfare determination itself, uh, but this... Of course we could. Yes. But, but so are, are you inviting us to say that the court... I mean, the, the first thing is we can send it all back and say that the first instance judge must redetermine whether or not to embark on a welfare assessment, and if so, the extent scope of it. Second is that we say there should be a welfare assessment in the circumstances of this case, send it back for a case management hearing for the purposes of the court below deciding uh, what evidence is needed and perhaps whether or not to join the child. Um, so there are a number of yes. steps along the path. Uh, where, where do you invite us to, or how far down that path do you invite us to travel? Well, my Lord, sorry. Yes, I, I go on to say that my Lord could make a determination that a welfare assessment is necessary in this case and then leave it to the judge hearing the remitted hearing as a case management 
decision as to how that welfare investigation should be carried out. My Lord, if that was the decision, it shouldn't, it may be controversial, it may not, as to the, 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 the sort of investigation that would be carried out. I mean, one plainly has in mind the involvement of CathGas, which hasn't just appear to have happened in this case. Can I just turn my back? There, there hasn't even been any safeguarding in this case, I understand, by, by CAFGAS. So that would plainly have to be one step. It may very well be that a, a, the court would welcome a, a fuller CAFGAS assessment of the circumstances of this child. And the parties would then need to deal with evidential issues. So you, you, your defined. submission is that we should determine the welfare assessment uh, is required, but then list it for case management hearing before a judge to determine what inquiries evidence is justified and also whether or not to join the child. That would be another child of this age. That would, that would probably be something for CAFGAS to consider first before that sort of decision was taken. My Lords, I, I'm hesitating, I, but I, I think I would submit that my Lords have sufficient material uh, in the papers from the judgment and also from the supplementary bundle to be able to make the assessment that a welfare investigation is necessary. Can I just Which point out, in, the, in new, this wouldn't apply, would it apply to it? No, it wouldn't apply to it. Well, it would. It. well, if one's operating under the July 19. Yes, th then, but, the, but Brussels 2 revised, recast, would not apply because this it would be uh, under the unrevised EU regulation. The only reason I mention that, in the, in the revised Brussels 2, far greater emphasis is placed on hearing the voice of the child. And you will know that in other European member states, sorry, in European member states, uh, many judges hear from children at this age and younger. So uh, that would be a matter that I think would need to be considered as to how, whether the child was or wasn't uh, engaged in the proceedings. Sorry, that's a slight diversion. Yes. Anyway, your, your submission is, and I'm looking at the time, oh, sufficient okay. material before us to determine that a welfare assessment is required in this case. Does that bring grant two to an end. Uh, may I? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I've used up longer than I had thought. Don't worry, I think we've been asking a lot of questions. Yes. That, does it? Well, yes. Yes. Thank you, my lord. So, ground three, you recognise that manifestly contrary to public policy is a very high hurdle. Yes. If you were in a couple of sentences to identify the features of this case that would make it manifestly contrary to public policy? It's the harm that will be caused to, to L, indeed, likely trauma of, without being too emotive, being wrenched away from everything that's familiar to her, to a, a complete unknown of which she has <coughs> no sentient memory, into a completely new situation. When, when did she last go to reunion with her father? She, um, nine, at some point in 19. June July, 19. Was it July 2019? Sorry, can I just... I've got this. Was it June 2019? June, yes. It was just prior to the application. Yes. yes. So... Was it June or July? It was ju June. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And how old was she then? She was born in 26. Two, yes, June June nineteenth. She would have been two years and eight months. Two, two and a yeah, a half. Right. And then the the, the second point, which yes, I need add more than what I said in um, opening is the the Article Eight point that it's unnecessary because there's plainly another appropriate order, which is to regulate contact, and it's unjustified and it's disproportionate interference. Uh, for uh, the reasons that I took my Lord to earlier, connected to the, the likelihood that she 
is not going to have a meaningful relationship with her primary caregiver, her primary attachment figure. And my lovers, there's a, I haven't got the authority um, in the bundle, but there's a small point from Mr. Justice Blake and Riel that family life can't, certainly not with a child of this age, simply be carried out by remote means. I mean, that was in the noughties, in the 2007 case. And as we would submit as true now, even in COVID times where we've all had to rely on technology a lot more, but for a child this age, plainly the remote sort of contact that she would have if different my lords accept that the mother can't travel, can't reasonably travel, would be confined to simply visual um, contact over remote a remote platform without touching, without experiencing each other's love and affection. So ground four. That's ground three. Yes. Could, could I, just before you lose ground three, you said mother can't travel. The French Court of Appeal orders envisaged Elle living with her father, but having stay in contact with the mother in England at the father's expense, did it not? Ye yes, but um, the mother was still expected to return L to yes. the Union. Yes, but so what the French court envisaged was she lives in La Réunion, every now and then flies back to La to England yes. to see yes. mother. Yes, and I'd submit that that was still a an disproportionate interference with L's right to family life. Did, the, look, did the, the, the French court didn't actually envisage that the mother would go and live in La, La Réunion? No, no. no not, not permanently. Um, my Lord, grand, grand four questions, questions of enforcement. Um, my Lord, it, to, to some extent, this is an important matter for the application for a stay because of the um, fast approach um, time limits. Uh, my Lord, it would be provisions made for, by Mr. Justice McDonald simply can't take place because of the passage of time. If my lords uh, my, are minded to dismiss the appeal, um, my lord, the question of how enforcement should be implemented, we submit, should be remitted to the High Court to consider it, how, in the most child-centric way, the presumably to be enforced order of the French Court of Appeal should, in practical terms, in realistic child-centric terms, um, be implemented and that will not only be a question of dates but a question of matters as to the practical arrangements whether um, and to the extent that the implementation requires my client to travel and if so whether she's got a visa whether that should be it's such an important part of Elle's welfare that if not a precondition, um, it should be an important component uh, of the implementation package uh, for the court to consider whether some sort of psychological assistance is required, which was the mother's a case post-judgment, but before this court was approached. Um, practical matters such as her accommodation uh, in um, a reunion, essentially all the soft landing measures that a child would need if a child is going to change her residence. And, and my Lord, the only, the only final point that we would make on this ground is that if my Lord is reject, my Lord's are rejecting paragraphs one to three, the grounds one to three, under the, the scheme of B2A, it would be open for the mother uh, to approach the French courts in La Réunion for an appropriate remedy uh, to safeguard Elle's interests. We'd be submitting that she should have the opportunity to do that. Uh, my Lord, we've made points in our skeleton about how it is a distinct, the, the actual enforcement, the practical enforcement is a distinct issue uh, to enforceability 
and whether an order should be registered for enforcement. But given the time, I don't need to elaborate those further unless it would assist the court. So we just repeat that the practical but the you, questions of practical enforcement practicalities or practicability that's the word well is that no, what you're saying not practicability but the practical right um, measures for enforcement are distinct from enforceability right and plainly if the english courts through this court's decision decide that the french court of appeal order should be registered for enforcement that takes care of the issue of whether it is enforceable, but it doesn't take care, we would submit, of the issue of how, yes. in the particular circumstances, that um, order should be implemented. Uh, essentially, it's, it's Lord Justice Peter Jackson's point that, that all registration of enforcement means is that the courts have to treat it as an English order and would in take the appropriate enforcement steps accordingly. Um, my Lord, before I conclude, I just I was hoping to conclude by lunchtime. Can I just turn my yes. back for one moment? My client just want, wants me to emphasise that the, the father uh, has the practical means to visit England effectively whenever he wants in terms of financial um, resources. He has family here. But, but also that, that he's always very welcome to travel to England just on giving reasonable notice to see his daughter. Uh, and the, the mother wants me to emphasise that she has always been and will always be keen uh, to promote that contact. Thank you. Yes, we don't have any other questions. Mr. Cetera, can you just help us? How long do you think your submissions will be subject to interventions? Lord, if I focus on ground two um, and don't go astray in doing so, um, in any possible way, I might be able to conclude submissions in maybe one and a half, one right. three quarter hours. Okay. Mm. I'll do my best. Thank you. But well, I, and I'll briefly mention the others. You don't have much longer than that. Well, no, I don't, no. my lord. Thank That's you. What I had in mind. Yes. So we'll start again at two o'clock. <laughs>